Joseph D'Angelo was in the Navy. He was a police officer. He was married. He was like a Hannibal Lecter. Highly intelligent, highly sadistic, master manipulator. His first rape attack that we know of, he was 30 years old. This was a man who was clearly living a double life. A man in a leather hood entered the window of a house in Citrus Heights and sneaked up on a 16-year-old girl watching television alone in the den. He pointed a knife at her and issued a chilling warning. Make one move and you'll be silent forever, and I'll be gone in the dark. Crime after crime, it was that same terrifying M.O. I saw a flashlight shining down the hall, and I thought, no, that's odd. The leather gloves are really, really remembered because they made kind of a sound, you know, when they moved. He started ripping sheets or towels, I'm not sure, but it was very methodical and it was very slow. It was a time when a vast area was terrified of one evil being. This was a criminal who went by many different names. He was known as the East Area Rapist in Sacramento County, the original Night Stalker in Orange County. A 29-year-old wife was raped while her tied-up husband had to listen. A 17-year-old girl was attacked here. He would put his knees on the victim's chest, and he had a gun in one hand, a flashlight in the other. Peepings, prowlings, stalking. Over 100 burglaries. Police think he checked the home out before he strikes. He put plates on the man's back, and he told the man, if I hear these rattle, I will kill your wife. At least 13 homicides. <laughs> this is a sustained campaign of cruelty and viciousness that lasted for decades. Welcome to Crime Scene, a podcast that examines real life crimes. I'm Michelle McNamara of TrueCrimeDiary.com. Michelle McNamara was a true crime blogger. She was a writer and producer. She was a citizen detective and a true crime writer. Very much being a mom during the day, very much writing about true crime at night. She was working on all different types of unsolved cases. Then she found a case that really dug its claws into her. What turned him on was terror. The East Area Rapist Original Night Stalker is California's most prolific serial offender. He murdered more people than the Zodiac Killer, but has little name recognition. Partly that's because he moved between communities and his crimes spanned 10 years. Everything about it is a mystery, um, and it has such a boogeyman aspect to it. Michelle used to talk about this case, and the thing that boggled her mind is that people didn't know about it. This was one of the most horrific serial killers in history, and nobody talked about him. It's summer, 1976. It was the bicentennial. It's all about happy days. Happy days. Laverne and Shirley. Hostenbeck Incorporated. In those days, the middle class in America was thriving. We felt safe, but the crime rates were going up. But suburban Sacramento was considered a safe place in the mid 70s. You could ride your bike all over town. My parents would just tell us, be home before dark. People didn't lock their doors, they left their windows open, especially people close to the river would get the Delta breeze. Everything changed in the summer of 1976. An attack occurred in Rancho Cordova. A young lady woke up and there's a guy standing in the doorway and he blindfolded her, tied her up. And then sexually assaults her. This is the first known sexual assault attributed to the man we know as the East Area Rapist. Nobody knew about the first attack except the police. The first attack, the second, the third, the fourth. When this first started in Sacramento, a lot of the people didn't know what was going on. They didn't put it in, in the paper at the time. The press had not yet covered it because Sacramento County Sheriff's Department asked them not to. There was a reason for that, that if you put it in there, the suspect's going to know that you're looking for him. At the time the rape started happening in Sacramento, Sacramento Sheriff's Department didn't have a specialized sexual assault unit. Just whoever had a free caseload, you know, that could take on another case. And so I did not become involved with these cases until rape number five when it was Jane Carson. I was 30 years old. I was married with a three-year-old son. My husband was stationed at McClellan Air Force Base. 
Jane was a nurse. She was a colonel in the Air Force Reserve. It was about 6.30 in the morning. My three-year-old son hopped in bed with me for a snuggle. I heard the garage door close, and I knew my husband had just left for work. I saw a flashlight shining down the hall, and I thought, now that's odd, and I screamed out to my husband, what have you forgotten? And there was no answer. Then the rapist, all dressed in ski mask and dark clothes, shining a flashlight at her. He told us with clenched teeth, shut up or I'll kill you. He tells her to turn over and he's gonna tie her up. He gags us, both of us. He blindfolds us and he ties us up with shoelaces, very tight. His next move was to move my son. I was already scared to death, but this is where the fear really took place. All she's thinking about is the life of her little boy and saving him. After the rape was over, praise the Lord, he moved my son back next to me. I could feel his body, and then I was relieved. So we hobbled around to the front fence, screamed for a neighbor, and she called the police. And then Carol Daly, the female detective, showed up. And uh, I call her my angel. One of my great heroes of this story is Carol Daly. She was an investigator for the sheriff department in Sacramento. She was asked to go out and interview the victims. Maybe something that the man said, or something that he did to you, or uh, something that you recall hearing. Through that process, she was able to glean a lot of information, like what he would say to his victims. And sometimes he would call out a name. In one of the cases, uh, the victim said that uh, she heard him crying and saying, Bonnie. For years, detectives didn't know what to make of this name. Who's Bonnie? Bonnie was not a victim, but a mystery woman at the center of the case. Bonnie was the girlfriend and then fiance of Joseph D'Angelo. One of the first women to get a real glimpse of the psychopathy behind Joe D'Angelo was Bonnie Caldwell. She's 18, really smart, going to a community college studying nursing. And she's in the middle of the quad, and this older guy ambles up to her and begins a conversation. Bonnie talked about her relationship with Joe D'Angelo in the HBO docuseries, All Be Gone in the Dark. He was very gregarious, uh, outgoing to all my friends. We'd been together close to a year. He gave me a high solitaire engagement ring. And he told me that we're going to be married. They were both students at the time. He was studying criminal justice. So Joe was someone who initially was impressive to Bonnie. He was exciting. He had a motorcycle. He taught her to shoot. But the longer she dated him, the more trouble began materializing. He takes her on thrill rides. And this is where the relationship starts to show its hand with Joe. Joe, without saying a word to me, just turned right, went down a very steep bank that I had no idea what he was doing. He's obviously thrilled not just by the speed, but he's thrilled by Bonnie's terror. The rules were never for him. So many of the things that we did together, he pushed me toward fear. As they're riding on a motorcycle, the German Shepherd comes out from the side of the road and nips at the tires, and Joe swings a foot out and breaks the dog's neck instantly. There's such an efficiency to his movement that stuns her. Eventually, Bonnie said, I don't want to be with you anymore. She actually broke their engagement. He showed up at her house in the middle of the night he had a gun, and he told her that she had to marry him. Just inches from my face, there was the barrel of a, of a gun pointing at me, and it was Joe. What he said to me was, get your clothes on, get dressed, we're going to Reno, we're going to get married tonight. Her dad was able to break it up and send Joe on his way. I think it's a foreshadowing that he was going to use violence against people in the future. Bonnie breaks her engagement with Joe D'Angelo, and within just a few years, strange crimes start happening in Rancho Cordova. He would empty female underwear drawers and perfectly line up the underwear down the hallway. 
all control and power. This is my house now. These are my items now. He's the king of the house. Every obsession needs a room of its own. Mine was strewn with coloring paper on which I'd scribbled down California penal codes in crayon. It was around midnight on July 3rd, 2012, when I opened a document I'd compiled listing all the unique items he'd stolen over the years. He would take mementos, almost like they were trophies from inside the home. He would steal rings with engravings on them. He stole driver's license, he stole photos from albums. There is a fantasy component about these crimes. I still have a part of you. I have your jewelry, I have your driver's license, I have, you know, something that means something to you. And now I own it. He was a serial rapist known as the Ear, attacking women and girls, first in East Sacramento County. This place meant something to him. He attacked here first and kept coming back. Was it home? Some of the investigators, especially the ones who worked the case in the beginning, think so. We were always trying to figure out why victims were chosen and why the locations were chosen. For Joe D'Angelo, this was his home, right in his own backyard. He lived in three or four houses in this exact same area where many of the rapes were committed. He grew up in Rancho Cordova. He was familiar with uh, the playgrounds, the schools, the empty lots. This is the home of the first documented rape that occurred in Sacramento County. He was very agile. He could jump over fences. He knew which way to go from whatever neighborhood he was in. He knew that the best way to get in and out. He knew this area like the back of his hand. He grew up there. Joseph D'Angelo Jr. grew up the son of a master sergeant in the Air Force who moved around a lot. We met Joe when he was 13 years old. My father was stationed at Mather Air Force Base, and then his father was transferred there, and uh, we shared a duplex. The girl who became very close to him at the time, Judy, described a very lonely boy. He was missing a family. His mother and father had split when he was young. At a very young age, he was neglected. He and his siblings would be locked in the closet and then beaten by the father. For his siblings, uh, Joe D'Angelo received the worst of his uh, vitriol and anger when they were growing up. Joe was always over at our house, and he just became a good family friend. He never talked about himself. He never talked about any problems he might have. He never discussed anything that was bothering him. They started uh, reporting, you know, the peeping toms here in, in Rancho. And I remember I was in the bedroom and I was asleep and I had this feeling, I woke up because I had this feeling somebody was there. And when I looked up and glanced towards the window, I saw this outlined figure. I didn't do anything to let them know I saw them, that I was aware of them. So the next morning I came in here and I says, Dad, I says, somebody was peeking in my window last night. And he says, what? And I says, yeah, and there was footprints out there in the dirt, two distinct footprints there. It's very common for sexual offenders to start out, particularly in adolescence, as peepers or voyeurs that are creeping around the neighborhood, looking in windows, watching women undress, almost like a training ground. Many of us had never seen anything like this before in our career. His whole thing was terror. It wasn't the sex. It was the terror that he wanted to put in these people that was his number one priority. His victims ranged in age from 13, I think, to, to 39. Out of the first 10 attacks, six of those were juveniles. Oftentimes, sex offenders or sexual serial murderers will start out with I guess easier victims, victims that are younger, that are more vulnerable, victims that he can control. My name is Chris Pedretti. I was 15. I was a kid, just a normal kid. Cartwheels in the front yard, 
and really not a care in the world. It was not ever even a thought that our world might be unsafe. So it was a week before Christmas. She'd been left home alone. I was supposed to go to a high school dance. And it was the last day before Christmas vacation. I put a pizza in the oven and I went to go play the piano. I remember hearing a noise and I stopped playing and listened. Didn't hear it again. No, it was nothing. So I kept playing. It was very shortly after that, probably seconds, that he approached me. She turned around and she saw a man in a ski mask. I froze. The brain stopped thinking at that point. I mean, I just went straight into survival mode. I don't remember thinking at that point anything other than kind of turning into a robot, just do what he says, do what he says. It was like Chris had left the body and it was just the body left. That individual led her to the back patio. She tied her up. I didn't know about rape. I certainly didn't know about sex. What he did to me, what he took from me, I can't ever get it back. He kind of ruined my childhood. You know, he, he took it away. Everybody knew something was going on, but nobody knew exactly what. The sheriff decided that we would hold community forums. I had no idea there were going to be several hundred people that would show up. If we have a gun, could we shoot him? Knowing what I know about this man, if I had a gun, I definitely would shoot him. And I would not shoot to injure, I would shoot to take care of him. He liked this. He liked the police being on edge. He liked the town being on edge. I have a gun, but I still don't feel safe being, you know, at home alone. Law enforcement was bracing for more attacks as his rampage of violence continued. His tactics were changing, and no one knew what he would do next. So I have to admit, I'm scared to death. The young girl made one bad move after another. Her attitude was much too inviting. She should never have stopped to window shop at night. In the 1970s, when a woman reported rape, she was shamed, she was blamed. Often she was ostracized by her own community. Rape cases really weren't considered serious. They were misdemeanor. You had to make an arrest within a year or else they were not prosecuted. Even if an arrest was made, the defense was always it was the victim's fault. Rape was such a prevalent crime back in those days that there were multiple serial rapists operating in California. 217 were reported last year. That's about one every day and a half. In the Bay Area, you had the stinky rapist who smelled like diesel fuel. I had pillowcase rapist. He had the key car rapist. When the East Area Rapist became active in Sacramento, he quickly upstaged all the other rapists in the area because of how terrifying his M.O. was. Concern over rape is mounting in this community. There was panic in the city of Sacramento. The fact that they couldn't catch this guy just ignited the city in fear. No one knows where or when he'll strike again. <laughs> They were getting guard dogs. They were putting in alarm systems in their homes. Have the dog in the house, the big dog. The worst thing is not knowing. All you can do is take every possible precaution and then hope that he gets caught before he gets to you. Every day in the newspaper, it was number eight, it was number 10, it was number 15, 20. You know, it just kept going on and on and on. It seemed like every time investigators thought they were getting close, he would disappear. But he kept attacking again and again. He was elusive, like a puff of smoke in the night. Detective Carol Daly wanted this serial rapist behind bars, and she was relentless in her pursuit of him, but constantly frustrated by the fact that they couldn't catch him. The officers in this department are working on this case are frustrated because there's just no evidence to give any firm lead. 
we're doing everything humanly possible to catch this man. He was a phantom. Descriptions ranged pretty widely. One person thought he was Hispanic. And now all of a sudden, he's blonde hair, blue eyed. There are like eight, nine, ten drawings of him. And they have completely changed. The best descriptions that we had were his height and his possible weight. We knew he wore a size nine shoe. When the police were taking the victim's statements, many of the women described his penis as being very, very small. We said, all right, if he is so under endowed, we went to a doctor who specialized in what I would call infantile penises to see if he had any patients that came in. And we didn't have any luck there. It's a very serious situation. I think it's very dangerous. And the last thing I think of when I'm going to bed is I look at the doorway in my bedroom and I think that he could be standing there. Detective Daly was following every lead. We filled out a long background form for the victims. Where did they go to school? What did they look like? What age were they? You know, what was their bill? There was no pattern among any of the victims because he was just prowling. He would see them and follow them home. Margaret Wardlow, she was just 13 years old when she was attacked by the East Area Rapists. Margaret was probably the strongest young victim I have ever talked to. Growing up in Sacramento was great. Where we lived was ideal. It was uh, right next to the American River. Go down there with my dog after school, go fishing. I totally felt safe. Margaret had a curiosity about her. She wanted to know about the East Area Rapists. I was a reader of everything I could get my hands on that had to do with this individual. Like, what was making this guy tick? Why was he doing this? She herself became a victim. I believe there was a pre-wired strength in her mind that helped her survive this attack. It was a school night, just my mother and myself. And I went to bed at like a regular school night hour. I was awoken about 2.30 in the morning with a flashlight in my face. I thought it was a joke. I thought he had, my mom had asked him to like come in and wake me up and scare me or something. As he tied her up and then was, went into the mother's room, Margaret knew that either her or her mother were going to be the victim. The rapist tied up her mother and put plates on her back as a warning device. He did that with so many of the victims when there was more than one person in the house. If he heard anybody moving, he was right back and told them, don't move, don't move, I'm gonna kill you, I'll kill you. Putting the dishes on someone's back, he knows he has to do something, either hurt them, flee. So as much of the bravado as he's trying to convey, he's scared of the physical confrontation. A little voice inside of me said, you know, you get out of a lot of stuff, Margaret, but you're not gonna get out of this one. The whole time he'd been threatening me, he'd been saying, do you wanna die? He wanted fear, he wanted to see fear in me. This is your psychological sadist. He is enjoying controlling that woman like that. This guy was so beyond the pale, and that was why Michelle was so interested in him, is because he was so frightening. The way he walks around people's houses and the way he destroys them and sort of hangs out and eats, there's something so psychologically fascinating about that to me. It's like he got to the emotional center of people's lives and just wanted to destroy that. Michelle caught the bug. She started going down the rabbit holes in this case. At this point, instead of writing a book, she was investigating the case. I'm obsessed. It's not healthy. I know the strangest details about him. I know his blood type. I know his penis size. He vaulted fences. He escaped foot chases. But I believe it's the rare moments when he was human that will be his downfall in the end. As time went on, this East Area rapist started to crisscross Sacramento, attacking women home alone or women with their kids in the middle of the night. He seemed to be expanding what his capabilities were when he was carrying out these crimes. He became much more aggressive in his tactics. He did more horrible things than than I can even describe. This tells us that the offender is adapting and learning as he is committing crimes. He really messes with people's minds, both the investigators and the victims. 
part of the thrill of the game for him was a kind of connect-the-dots puzzle he played with people. He stole two packs of Winston cigarettes from the first victim and left them outside the fourth victim's house. Junk jewelry stolen from a neighbor two weeks earlier was left at the fifth victim's house. It was a power play, a signal of ubiquity. I am both nowhere and everywhere. You may not think you have something in common with your neighbor, but you do. Me. Michelle started as a blogger talking about cases that no one else was paying attention to and trying to get people motivated to look at those cases. The case dragged me under quickly. Curiosity turned to clawing hunger. I was on the hunt, absorbed by a click fever that connected my propulsive tapping with a dopamine rush. I wasn't alone. I found a group of hardcore seekers who congregated on an online message board and exchanged clues and theories on the case. Citizen sleuths, they are ordinary people that go to work, they go home, they put their kids to bed, and then they go on the computer. And they spend hours and hours trying to solve certain crimes. My name is Paul Haynes. I was Michelle McNamara's research collaborator. When I first began learning about the case, there was a specific forum dedicated to the East Area Rapists. It was the most active forum on that website. Paul Haynes was a writer living in Florida, and Michelle recognized that he had a great proclivity for digging into old archives and things. It was a case that a lot of citizen detectives got into because there were so many clues. Eron's wasn't a supervillain. He was a man, a guy with habits and traits and preferences that, with enough examination, should shine like Hansel's breadcrumbs in the woods. My name is Kay Gilbraith, and I call myself a researcher. I started seeing patterns emerging to me where I became convinced it was solvable because all of the crimes had common bonds. He was leaving ligatures at the scene with this particular knot. He would eat uh, food out of the victim's refrigerators. I was spending every waking hour trying to find men who fit the criteria. And it was at that time that I first connected with Michelle. It's a fascinating community. I had been on those boards for a while following the story because everyone had such great information. Michelle's quest was to get this case solved. She just had an abiding curiosity in letting the details lead us to the perpetrator. The East Area Rapist would target not people, but neighborhoods. You can see the proximity of these homes to green belts like drainage ditches and creeks and canals. We believe he used the canal as an escape route, which ran along uh, the back of so many properties. He was a great escape artist. These are passageways that this killer used to surveil the residents unseen, cloaked by the darkness of these green belts. He was able to look over those fences, look into those homes, look at what time people ate dinner. I mean, he knew what time the husband left. The Sacramento Sheriff's Office has invested more than 40,000 man hours in the search for the East Area Raven. Sacramento would have a helicopter up in the sky, and they all knew it was because they were chasing the East Area Rapist. It was terrible. It was terrible to hear that. Well, he didn't like it either. And it turns out that he served in Vietnam. He left Sacramento because of that helicopter. And then these things started up in the East Bay of San Francisco. There are two things known about the rapist. One is he has never been caught in a home where there was a man present. The other is He's never been in a home where there has been a big dog. The East Area Rapist worked on challenges. Everything he saw in the paper, we said he didn't do something, he did it the next time. When the newspapers reported that he was just attacking single females, he took this as a challenge. At attack number 16, he started an attack with a man present, and then two thirds of the attacks he does since then has a man present. He is purposefully choosing couples. My name's Gay Hardwick. 
And my name's Bob Hardwick. And we've been married 41 years this August. Happily married 41 years. Bob and Gay Hardwick were a couple living in Stockton, California. We had picked out a home in one of the little picture perfect tree lined streets. We were just happy in our new home living together. The day of our attack was March 18th, 1978, and we were attack number 31. We had gone out to dinner and a movie, normal Friday night, and we came home around 10 o'clock and went to bed. Later that night, we were awakened by very bright light right in our faces and a voice saying, wake up, wake up. The attack on Bob and Gay Hardwick was much like all the other attacks in that he confronted Bob and Gay when they were in bed. He ordered her at gunpoint to bind Bob. Nothing you can do when there's a 357 Magnum pointed at your, at your head. He then bound Gay. He retied Bob, turns him over, puts the plates on his back as a warning device. Things would go silent for a period of time. And then as soon as they moved, he was right in their face. Move and I'll kill you. Ultimately, he moved Gay into the living room where he sexually assaulted her. You're convinced at that moment that this is not a full human being that you're dealing with. He can not only humiliate a woman who's about to rape, but he can also completely, in his mind, emasculate her partner, putting him in a position where he is helpless and has to listen to what's going on in a different room. These attacks are happening in the macho 1970s. You know, Six million dollar man. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. Well, talk to me, good buddy. And Burt Reynolds, you know, these are the icons. And the men were not looked at as victims. They were looked at as just being weak for not being able to protect their wives and their girlfriends. I never talked to anybody about it over the years. I just wanted to put it out of my mind, you know? It was, well, we're going to get through this. We're going to get back to normal. And you don't ever really, really make it to normal. It was tough. But, you know, I loved her. And, uh, and I, I said, we're going to get through it. Our home never felt the same again. Every surface that you could think of was covered in fingerprint dust. It just looked like a smoke bomb had been set off in our house. It was contaminated and ruined for us. He wasn't out attacking people on lovers' lanes or in parks. He was attacking people where they feel the most safe, in bed with their partner in their home. And he was able to say, you know what? I have so much power, I can take all of that security away and devastate your life. Why couldn't they catch him? Somehow, he was always one step ahead of law enforcement. And they wondered, could he be one of us? After the East Area Rapist would terrorize these women, sometimes he would call them and taunt them. Hello? Hello? This rapist did not stop with just the assault of that night. He terrorized them their whole lives. This is that psychological sadist at work. He is getting off on continuing to cause fear in his victim. I'm Michelle McNamara of TrueCrimeDiary.com. 
Larry Crompton is a retired lieutenant for the Contra Costa Sheriff's Department. He worked on the Rapist Task Force in the 70s. How optimistic are you that, that, you know, that he may be caught one day? Very, very optimistic. I had worked many, many crimes while I was on the department, but none of them were really like this. I knew what these people went through, and I knew what the family was going through. I couldn't let it go. And for many, many years, it was me. What did I miss? What did I do wrong? Why didn't I catch him? Helicopters, roadblocks, citizen patrols taking down plate numbers, hypnotists, psychics, nothing. You were a scent and shoe impressions. Bloodhounds and detectives tracked both. They led away. They led nowhere. He next shows up down in Modesto in June of 1978. He attacks a couple down there. And then 48 hours later, he's up in the town of Davis, over 110 driving miles away and is attacking a UC Davis co-ed there. Early Wednesday morning, the infamous masked man made his 44th attack on a young couple living in Mission San Jose. It was as if he knew what police were doing. And all along, many of the detectives who were working the case thought that, that maybe he was a police officer or a military. And ultimately, that turned out to be true. You should have seen me coming. One of the things that's important to remember when you're looking at Joseph Angelo is he actually graduated with an associate degree in police science. He had told Bonnie uh, that his aspiration was to join the California Highway Patrol. You should have seen studied evidence and he studied crime scene. He went to uh, Northern California and he applied with the Auburn Police Department and was hired there. And then that's when he started his rapes. He actually started out committing crimes as a teenager. At some point he even blew up a dog with a firework, um, killed the dog um, while he was committing a residential burglary. It makes sense that somebody who has a need for control, wants to be in power, would be attracted to a position that allows him to have that every single day. When I was working the cases, I thought he's got to be in law enforcement. The first clue was an attack number three in Sacramento. He had gloves on to protect from fingerprints, and he's got a gun in one hand and a padded baton in another hand. And he says, freeze or I'll shoot. We felt so strongly that he could have a law enforcement background that we were looking at every officer in our department who fit the description of the height and the weight and the shoe size. Up to that point, he would sometimes take his clothes off to the sexual assault. Carol and I figured out how to fingerprint the human body. We found out that fingerprints stayed on the skin for really just a very short period of time, but there was an iodine technique that we could use to try to pull them off. Carol and I talked to the guy in charge and said, don't talk about this on the radio. They blasted all over the place. Just a couple of days later, his gloves never came off. There's no question you know what we're doing. The police have one last bit of advice, and that is don't panic, because that alters your judgment. And by the way, that advice goes out to anyone in the Bay Area, not just the people of Concord, because with this guy, the next rape could be anywhere. Michelle was a mother, and she was a wife. And when she took this book on, this investigation became her life. It's really, the obsession is with the investigation. And she knew that when you look at cases out there, famous serial killer cases, they were caught with innocuous things. He was 
first and foremost, it seems to me, a burglar, a cat burglar. I think Michelle felt that if she could find one of the items that had been stolen in any of those rapes or in any of those burglaries, she could trace that item back the way you would trace someone's ancestry to its original owner. And that would lead to the, the offender's identity. And in one case, this offender stole a pair of personalized monogrammed cufflinks. It was the initials NR. They were like a 1950s style. So Michelle took this and thought, if I could follow those pair of cufflinks, we might get closer to the answer. Then I saw it, a single image out of hundreds loading on my laptop screen. They were going for $8 at a vintage store in a small town in Oregon. My husband was on his side sleeping. I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at him until he opened his eyes. I think I found him, I said.